Rev it up and welcome to Cars Yeah, show number 1,952. Be prepared to be inspired. This is Cars Yeah, where you'll enjoy interviews with inspiring automotive enthusiasts. Mark Green is here to provide you with a fuel injection of automotive inspiration. So get in, sit down, buckle up, and get ready for a wild ride here on Cars Yeah. Hello, inspiring automotive enthusiasts, and welcome to Cars Yeah. Today I'm in Charlotte, North Carolina, with a very special guest by the name of Kelly Crandall. Hey, Kelly, welcome to Cars Yeah. Do you have any gear, and are you ready to release the clutch? I am ready. Let's do it. All right, we'll have some fun here. Now, before I give you a proper introduction and we dive into your world, what's one little thing that most people don't know about you, Kelly? Mm. Yeah, I'm not as interesting as people might think, so I don't really know <laughs> if there's anything that, that would be interesting. But I guess the first thing that came to mind is I think when I was probably, I guess, about a teenager mm -hmm. in order to be able to work there, I worked at one of the concession stands at English Town Raceway Park that no longer exists. Oh, but wow. For, um, yeah, I think I was in the pizza booth selling pizza, pizza booth. And, <laughs> yeah. and French fries or something to that effect at English Town Raceway Park in New Jersey. That sounds like one of those classic summer jobs for teenagers that uh, I think they've even made some movies about about those uh, amusement parks or raceways or whatever, where there's always a group of kids together. And uh, But was it fun for you? I mean, did you were you able to get out and see any of the racing or were you, is it like most people when they work at these venues, all they do is hear the noise and go, I wish I was out there watching the race. Yeah, I am going to be honest. I really didn't want to be there. I don't <laughs> <laughs> I, I working in the service industry was not for me. Again, yeah. I, I was I was young. I wanted to do other things with my time at, at that time. I wasn't even into drag racing as much as I am now. So it was more of one of those things where, again, I think I just needed something to do or my parents wanted me to have a job and start getting out there. So I don't remember much about it, but I do know that I did not really want to be there. <laughs> well, you know, I, I told my kids this because they all were, were pretty much required to have summer jobs and uh, and so forth. And many times after a summer, they go, well, I know I don't want to do that for a living. And I said, well, there you go. That was a great way to learn that the easy way when you didn't have to rely on it to pay the mortgage or the rent or buy food. So uh, we, we learned some great things. But I assume you probably learned some a couple of decent skills about interacting with people because interacting with people in the service industry takes patience. Yeah, you're absolutely correct. I, I did learn about that and listening exactly to what they had to say mm -hmm. and realizing that I wanted nothing to do with having to work cash registers or <laughs> Doing food. anything, <laughs> yeah, or doing any. No, it was mostly the cast registers and not wanting to do anything with numbers, which makes sense because I've always hated math. I'm terrible at math and wanted nothing to do with having to make change or just <laughs> trying to learn anything about dealing and handling a cash register was not for me. There you go. Well, see, there again, you learn what you don't want to do. And that's very important in life for sure. Well, obviously you figured out what you want to do. So let me give you a little introduction here and we're going to dive in your world. Kelly Crandall has been on the NASCAR beat full time since 2013. She joined Racer Magazine as chief NASCAR writer in 2017. And you regular listeners will remember just last week or so I had Paul Fanner, uh, the head of Racer on the show. So if you missed my talk with with Paul. Uh, go back and give it a listen. He's a wonderful guy and uh, definitely, Kelly, you're fortunate to be working around an, an icon in the industry. Her work has also appeared in NASCAR.com, the NASCAR Illustrated Magazine, and NBC Sports. A corporate communications graduate from Central Penn College, Kelly is a two-time George Cunningham Writer of the Year recipient from the National Motorsports Press Association. Congratulations. That's very cool. We'll be back in just a minute. A first, a word from our valued sponsor, so give them a little listen. Keep the seat belts on. We're going to be doing some racing today, I think. We'll be right back. I love Covercraft's new five-layer all-climate cover. It was developed and engineered for anything Mother Nature can throw our way. It's very soft, breathable, and easy to store and pampers your paint and interior surfaces, providing maximum UV, rain, dust, and snow protection. Add their gust guard for windy conditions for extra protection. Their five-layer all-climate cover is custom-tailored with Covercraft's attention to detail, form and fit with a quality and attention that's been their standard since 1965. Covercraft protects cars, trucks, motorcycles, RVs, trailers, and watercraft 
Covercraft too. Every one of my vehicles is protected by a Covercraft cover. And I have a deal for you. Use the code YA21 at Covercraft.com and you'll get 10% off your Covercraft order plus free shipping. That's right, 10% off and free shipping. Just type in the word YA, Y-E-A-H, 2-1 at checkout. Yeah, 21 at Covercraft.com. Covercraft, protecting the things that move you. Most people don't think about their collector car insurance until their annual premium becomes due. Well, why wait and see if there are better options for your beloved rides? I didn't. Did you know if you change carriers before your policy runs out, your insurance company has to refund you the unearned portion of your policy premium? I did my homework, I shopped around, and I found American Collectors Insurance. And that's who protects my Porsche Turbo. That's right, the one I call my Orange Crush. They've been protecting collector vehicles since 1976. I encourage you to call my friends at American Collectors Insurance. Ask them about their agreed value policy. And if your collector vehicle is on your regular auto policy, you will be shocked at the savings, not to mention the assurance, should something bad happen to your ride, that you'll get what your vehicle is actually worth. Give them a call today for a quote at 866-ACI-YEAH. That's 866 866- 224-9324. Tell them you're a friend of Mark Green at Cars Yeah. American Collectors Insurance. Classic car insurance designed by collectors for collectors. Automotive enthusiasts just like you and me. That's American Collectors Insurance. Give them a call today. So, Kelly, uh, let's take a, a dive into the corner a little deeper here um, or a faster run down the drag strip because I know you love things that have wheels. Kind of walk us through what besides serving pizza to people at a raceway, what got you into this career? How did you figure out that this was something you wanted to do for a living? Well, that would go back to high school. I was lucky enough early on to figure out what I wanted to do with my life. I have always enjoyed English classes, reading, writing. And when I was in high school, I just, one of my English teachers suggested that I write for the school newspaper. And at that time, I had started kind of dabbling a little bit and just writing my own racing stories just based off of what I was seeing from home. So she suggested, you know, writing for the school newspaper and just learning more about what goes into something like that. From there, I just wanted to combine the two things that I enjoyed the most, which was racing and writing. At that time, I was really, really into racing, was really, really into NASCAR, had become a diehard fan. Uh, About 2002, the first race I watched was in 2001. But by 2002, 2003, I was really, really into it. And then by high school, I graduated in 2008. When I went off to college, I already knew what I wanted to do. So it started in high school, just combining two things that I really love, which were racing and writing. Now, do you realize how fortunate you are because so many young people have no clue going into college or even when they exit college what they really want to do? And I've always mentored young people and advised young people or even older people that have been doing things they really don't like and they want to change their careers is discover your passion. And there's always this controversy over that. Oh, no, no, that shouldn't be what you should do. But for you, it worked, right? Yeah, absolutely. And it was funny because before that, I thought I was going to be a scientist of some sort because I really enjoyed the CSI shows and they made it look so cool. Uh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so I, I thought I was going to go and, and do something like that, which again, never would have worked out because I don't think I would have enjoyed uh, the science and the math and everything involved in, in that type of thing. But that was what I thought I was going to do. So yeah, w- around sophomore year in high school is when things took a turn, thankfully, uh, through having some really good English teachers. Well, it's nice when we have great educators that help uh, encourage our strengths and our passions and help guide us kind of down the path. So let's talk a little bit about where your career has been, what you've been doing up until starting to work for uh, Racer Magazine, let's say, because there's a time period there where you were writing and doing, were you doing freelance work or were you working at different entities? So I started self-publishing back when Bleacher Report had really kind of first come on the scene. And at that time, anybody could sign up and create a profile. So that was about 
2009, 2010. And I was just self-publishing. I had no insider access. I was not going to races. I was just self-publishing on the internet from afar of thinking I knew what I was doing. Uh, When I graduated from college, I did some work, again, just self-publishing through Speedway Media at one point. I started working in about 2013 for Popular Speed, which is no longer around. And uh, we had a great group over there. Uh, really an up-and-coming website of Matt Weaver. Um, Racing fans might know his name. He was uh, one of my colleagues over there. So I was at Bleacher Report for many, many years, really started to kind of get my foot in the door through that website. I started getting media credentials more often. I was traveling to races more often, um, networking more, and really, again, just starting to make a name for myself through that website. Uh, After I left there in about 2016, um, I did some freelance work for NASCAR.com. Yes, I've done some freelance work for NASCAR Illustrated, the magazine Mm -hmm. at the time. And uh, then I picked up a part-time gig with NBC Sports for um, about six months or so. Uh, before joining racer.com. And I joined racer because they were looking for someone. I was looking for something a little bit more permanent. Mm -hmm. As I said, NBC Sports was just kind of on a part-time basis and and really in assistance to the greats of Dustin Long and and Nate Ryan. So I was just looking for something a little more permanent to get back on the road, to get back at the racetrack and, and, uh, and, everything in that regard. So Racer was looking for something. I was looking for something. And and, uh, we came together and I started with them right before the new year of 2017 and have been with them ever since. Well, Paul is such a great guy. I really enjoyed having him on the show. And he's devised, or I should say, put together a wonderful team of people. And he's been one of those mainstays that has survived all the different gyrations that have happened. And you being a writer know, I mean, the magazine industry seems to have been kind of washed through in the last five, six years. And a lot of magazines have disappeared and all this online is happening. But do you see the transitions that's happening with online for writers versus traditional print magazines or comic? combinations uh, as a benefit or as a good thing that's been happening? I mean, I don't know if it's a benefit. I'm not well-versed enough to speak to anything like that, but I will say that you're absolutely correct that it's definitely the more dominant form of coverage, right, for any sport, not just auto racing, but I think any form of, of any sport, there's a lot more access to things online than you're getting from Uh, print these days, whether it's magazines or newspapers. And that's just the way that the world is gone. So it's just much easier. Uh, I'm assuming it's probably cheaper for companies to go the the internet route than it is the print route. So I don't know if I can really say that that it's better that way. But again, I think it offers obviously more access. Has it changed your writing style? Because one of the things that we hear these days is people want quick snippets of things versus long, drawn-out uh, articles. And if you think about well, even, well, magazines, you see the articles are a little bit longer, but you don't seem to see that kind of coverage when it comes to online coverage of things anymore because our attention spans are shorter because we have just way too much stuff coming at us and too many things that we want to try to catch on. Has, has you seen having to adjust your writing style or has that not been a factor for you? Well, I've never actually had um, any experience doing anything for a magazine or newspaper unless it was picked up from something that I did on the Internet. For oh, instance, okay. for instance, USA Today and Racer, I guess you would describe it as a cross content agreement. So USA Today has picked stuff up and put it in the newspaper that I've written for the website, but I've never actually done any work in my time in the media that was specifically for racer magazine or a newspaper. When I was doing stories for NASCAR Illustrated, that's a magazine, so I guess that would be the only experience that I have. Uh, From what I remember, I I can't say there was anything different than writing for a website. It was more, you had to be aware of your word count. You had to be aware of things like that so that because they knew what the layout of the magazine was going to be. Sure. But... Uh, no, for me personally, I can't say that anything is, has really been different because I don't have a newspaper background. But when it comes to the Internet, if you're talking about comparing that to the magazine, you made a good point. You know, With magazines, you can do longer pieces. You can frame things differently. You can lay it out differently. It might not necessarily be a story from 
that particular weekend because by the time the magazine is printed, it's not going to be timely anymore. Sure. Um, whereas, yes, for the website, I would say the only thing probably for everybody that's changed is you hit on it is it's instant access information. So if we live in a sport that anything can happen Monday through Sunday, it's a 24-7, 365 job, you're always going to be updating that website because news could break at any moment. Somebody could do something on social media. So yes, it, in a way, you're you're training yourself to just always be ready for something to happen. You can do long form features on the website. If people want to read that, I've done thousand words to almost 2000 word stories. I've also done 300, 400 words, quick news stories, or just something quick to get out there based on, you know, a social media post. So yeah, I can't speak directly to the differences there, but that's that's how I've approached things. So it seems like today writers in your roles like yours need to be much more multifaceted in many ways with the ability to do either or both or all of the above. Would that be a oh, fair absolutely. assessment? Absolutely. I've talked about that with other people in the profession is it just it serves you well to be educated and to be flexible and to teach yourself other platforms that you can utilize because that might make you make you attractive to uh, certain professions or or certain um, outlets. If mm -hmm. you can not only write, but hey, I can capture video or I can host podcasts or, you know, anything along those lines. So yes, you're absolutely correct. Being multifaceted nowadays is very important because again, with the internet, you can offer so many different forms of coverage, written, video, audio, podcast, uh, just there's, yes, there's so much that can be done now. And if you can be that one stop shop person, uh, you, again, you might be more attractive to an outlet that's looking to hire someone. Got to have a lot of tools in the toolbox these days is what I'm hearing from those comments <laughs> for sure. What's your favorite thing about what you do in your career? Just telling stories. I know that's probably a, a easy answer, but it's it's true. And I've said that many times to anyone who's asked is just telling stories, trying to find stories that no one's talked about or trying to find a different angle to a story that's out there, trying to tell it a different way than other people and personalities, just getting to the root of who someone is or, or what's going on that necessarily that doesn't necessarily have to do with what happened on the racetrack that weekend. Mm -hmm. So I just love telling stories and getting to sit with people and come up with questions that are unique or different or they or that they may not have been asked before. That's um, that's exciting to me. And that's again, I, I feel like that's something that that's what I guess you would say pushes me or. Yeah, Drive, it's, it's we'll say drives you. <laughs> Since we're talking about yeah, cars. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. Bad pun there. Well, I, I think that's much more interesting for the reader too. And if you can get a little bit more behind the scenes inside of somebody, I mean, everybody can go and watch a race or read a few things about, well, who won or what happened. Uh, but when you get behind the scenes uh, into somebody's head a little bit deeper, what drives them, what makes them tick and so forth, a lot more interesting to the uh, the listener or the reader, for sure. I would assume you've had some driving inspirations in your in your life, some mentors, uh, influential people. Is there somebody like that for you? Oh, of course. And I've been lucky enough when I came into the sport. There's so many great journalists that have come before me that I get to interact with. You know, I can name a ton of people like Marty Smith and Ryan McGee from ESPN. I've had the the pleasure of getting to know them just personally and professionally. I mentioned earlier getting to work alongside a Dustin Long and a Nate Ryan at NBC Sports just taught me so much just from observing, just yeah. from how they do their jobs or how they cover the sport and the way they think about stories to the way that you present them on the website. So I could just continue to name names and I would feel bad because I would leave people out. <laughs> no but, worries. Um, you know, Deb Williams, uh, who currently writes for RacingToday.com, but longtime NASCAR fans might remember her from when that was a big, big outlet uh, as far as, I guess you would say, a newspaper or a magazine back in the day. That was the number one go-to source in NASCAR. Uh, people in the garage would read them on a, on a weekly basis. So yeah. Deb has become not just a great friend. But I guess when I think of the word mentor, I would say mentor. She's, I ask her questions all the time, not just about 
things that might be going on in the sport and how, how I should do something. But I just love hearing stories from her of back in the day or how she did things or how the job has changed over the years. So again, I feel bad because I could probably keep going and I probably should mention a lot more people because I ask a lot of questions yeah. and I like to pick people's brains, but those are the, the ones that come to mind. It seems like there's more and more women going into the field as well. Obviously, you, you mentioned Deb. Go all the way back to Denise McCluggage, who I was fortunate to have on the show before we lost her and got to meet her a couple times and talk to her in person as well. But uh, do you see that happening, more and more women coming into the field in in relation to being writers and journalists and, and even photographers and videographers? Oh, yeah. I mean, it, there, we're... <laughs> We're all over. <laughs> um, <laughs> you gals are everywhere. <laughs> yeah, I mean, we're we're all over the garage, whether it's working for teams, whether it's being PR representatives or engineers even to nice. uh, pit crew members to journalists. Look at the Associated Press right now. Jenna Fryer covers not just NASCAR, but she's covering IMSA and IndyCar and Formula One. Lee Spencer was with Fox Sports for the longest time, is now with Racing Boys. She's another one that I talk to quite frequently. So... Uh, you mentioned Deb and yeah, there's, you know, younger folks or younger women like myself now that are coming up. NASCAR.com has uh, some great women over there. You look at Danielle Trotta on Sirius XM co-hosting a show during the week. Um, another great friend, great colleague. So we're, women are all over the garage for sure. We We may not be on the racetrack behind the wheel. I know people talk about that a lot or ask why there's not more female drivers, but there's a lot of females. There's a lot of women in motorsports across many different uh, what's the word I'm looking Venues. for here? Yeah, exactly. Venues. Well, I think it's great. I've had a couple drive, well, many uh, female drivers on the show, but just recently a couple drivers from the W series that were uh, racers right before they were racing at Coda as a uh, support race, a couple of races they did there for the F1 team. So I think it's great. If you were going to advise younger people to get into the career you have, you have now, how would you advise them? Well, networking is important, obviously. But we live in the era of social media. So use social media to your advantage. Use it as a portfolio. Um, if you can self-publish or if you can go work for a school newspaper or a local newspaper, cover anything. Don't just handicap yourself and say, well, I only want to do this. Nothing beats experience, as the saying goes. So mm -hmm. get experience where you can. Build that resume. Build that portfolio. And again, use social media. Put your work out there. Uh, network with people in the profession you want to go in, ask questions. So it's really this any of the simple things you would hear already that people are probably telling you in a classroom that you need to do, but it works. That's exactly what you need to be doing to build your name. Great advice. Let's take a short break for our sponsors here. We come back. I want to talk about a big challenge or obstacle that you face. So keep the seatbelt cinched tight and we'll be right back. I've discovered Linkage. It's a new quarterly publication and website that covers the automotive market, driving, restoring, collecting, and discovering your passion for motor vehicles. Linkage is about experiences, opinions, and values. Linkage is an actual, informed, reasoned opinion based on firsthand experiences. A talented Linkage team covers the automotive world, the people who share your passion and mine, Smart, considered, rational, and experienced opinions. Ones you can learn from and grow. That includes our passion that drives auctions and the collector car market. So come with me and join us on this journey. And be sure to use the code CARS yeah when you subscribe and they'll give you $10 off. Boom! Linkage, geared for the automotive life. Subscribe today at LinkageMag.com. Did you know that Cars Yeah! is in the top 1% of all podcasts based on listenership, according to Libsyn, the premier RSS feed for podcasts in the United States? That's right. And Cars Yeah! is the only five-day-a-week automotive-focused podcast for you to get your message into the ears of thousands of listeners daily from all over the world. Plus, DuPont Registry recommended Cars Yeah! is one of their top 10 car podcasts for you to enjoy. Cars yeah has experienced tremendous growth, plus your ads are evergreen, meaning they never go away. And more and more listeners find Cars yeah every day for their daily dose of automotive inspiration. Do you want to expose your brand to a highly targeted list of automotive enthusiasts in a very unique 
in very personal way? Well, I can help you. Contact me, Mark Green, at mark at carsyad.com or through the website at carsyad.com today to learn more. So, Kelly, let's talk about maybe a big challenge, big obstacle, could even be a big failure that you came up with against with your career or could be in life doesn't really matter the more important part of this is what did it teach you so you can move forward in a positive way yeah I feel lucky in the sense of I don't think I've made any big mistakes or had any big hurdles to overcome I will say for me a lot of it is just my personality so for instance I would say my biggest challenge just in life and and certainly in a career like this where you have to go talk to people is I am very shy and introverted and I don't like approaching people oh, unless it yeah. right so so a job like this where you have to go talk to people you have to go get the story or go get the quote uh, for me, there's times where I still have to tell myself, go and do it. You've got to go talk to that person. <laughs> yeah. Uh, you know, even, you know, cert- you know, examples when drivers are mad or angry, you know, they don't want to talk to you, but it's my job. I got to go be that person to go be in that scrum and I have to be there and, and get those quotes and ask those questions. So for me, that's something that I deal with every day is just trying to get over that hump of mm-hmm. I have to approach people. I've got to go talk to people. You've got to keep your face out there. That's part of the job. Whereas again, I'm, I'm so shy and introverted that if you know I can set something up beforehand, I'm much more comfortable doing it. But you can't, again, you can't always do that in this profession, especially when it's live race weekend, you got to get out there and, and go talk to people. So I would say, I, again, I, I can't think of anything or, or, or an example of where I've messed up or, or had a, something that I've had to face or a challenge. But to me, that is a challenge is, again, just kind of combating uh, my personality with what I have to do for this job. So what are a couple of great tips? Because this is a pretty common thing for a lot of people. They've said that many people are more afraid of getting in front of a group of people and speaking than dying, which is hard to believe, but I've heard (laughs) that before. How would you advise somebody who has that shyness, that introvertedness, uh, maybe a tip or trick you might offer that's worked for you to help kind of nudge them out there? Because what I've understood, or what I've learned doing what I'm doing is it's the old adage from Nike, just do it. Just start doing it. I mean, Get- that, that's it. That's exactly it. I mean, there, I, listen, if there's a big grand secret out there or or a better tip or trick, people can, t- can tell me what it is. But it is. It's as simple as that. You got to do it. Again, this is the job. This is the job that I chose. This is what I want to do. I have to go talk to people. Um, and I also try to tell myself that their reaction, again – using the example of upset drivers is don't take it personally. You know, just don't take it personally. You have a job to do. uh, They have a job to do. And just don't take it personally. It's, you know, at the end of the day, if, if as long as you're still respectful and you do it the right way, then it shouldn't carry over. And so that's another thing too, is just, I always try to just be respectful, whether it's an upset driver or whether it's just approaching people in general, don't barge up on people, you know, make sure you introduce yourself. Just again, just common sense type things of just always treat people well, treat p- people with respect and make those relationships. And that will help you in the long run as well. But um, yeah, if there's a, a better way of doing it, I'm all ears. <laughs> well, it's kind of what you do. And there's just some things I, I learned way back in, in my other career, way before I was doing this. And I would go out and find clients to bring into a company. I worked in advertising for 11 years as a creative director, but I wanted to make more. So my boss said, well, go out and bring in business. I said, oh, how do I do that? And he kind of showed me how to do it. But a couple of things that he he taught me that are really easy and you do this already. I do it already. But for people listening that might be faced with this is learn to ask better questions and be a good listener. If you just ask a great question and shut up, yep. people will appreciate you because they'll sense that you genuinely want to know something about them, their profession or their sport or their hobby. It's the same with car shows. If you walk up to somebody and just Ask them about their vehicle and then stop talking and let them talk. Uh, th- there's an instant like about you that somebody else has. Would you agree? Absolutely. Absolutely. One of the things that I've heard a few times throughout the years is that 
I ask good questions. And again, I'm not saying that about myself. Is is I've been lucky enough and blessed enough where people have told me that. They've gone out of their way to say, you ask good questions, you know what you're talking about, you research, and I pride myself on that, absolutely. Now, there's some times where you need to ask the simple question, such as, as like you just said, tell me about your car or something to get them talking and break the ice and to relate to them. But when I'm doing feature stories or when I'm doing podcasts, that's absolutely correct is I want people to know that if they're going to give me time, I'm going to make it worth it because I'm going to know what I'm talking about. I'm going to ask unique and interesting questions and not just the, as I describe them, the softball lazy questions. Yes. Uh, so, yes, I, I completely agree. And again, in my case, it's worked because, as I said, people remember that and they've told me that over the years. And hopefully that that translates to people wanting to work with me. And I think part of that is doing your homework before you step up. I've watched some great interviews with race car drivers, let's say, and uh, where the questions are just silly. I mean, they're just almost stupid. You know, how do you feel about your win? OK, was well, there something better you could ask? Because I feel fine. feel pretty good. Yeah, feel great. Uh, I even saw a great interview with an F1 driver the other day on YouTube where the, the question, I don't even remember the question. It was so silly, but the driver looked at him and said, seriously, that's your question? You know, yeah. It's just like. Yeah, I never want to be in those situations. No, no. And, and it's because it was almost as if the, the interviewer had not done their homework. And you can go on YouTube and see some great shutdowns by uh, especially celebrities to interviewers. I'm like, that's what you're going to ask me? That's really? Come on. You know, or or the interviewer even doesn't even know who they're talking to. Those are really funny. It's like, uh, you got the wrong guy. I wasn't in that movie. Uh, yeah. I was always laugh at those. So yeah, ask great questions. Learn to be a great listener. Do your homework. Definitely. Hey, let's talk about a special vehicle in your life. I would assume you like cars, maybe motorcycles. I don't know. But is there a special vehicle in your life? And maybe you could share a story about that ride. You know, I don't. Um, <laughs> oh, I'm, I, 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 so listen, I cover car racing, but I'm, <laughs> I don't know cars, to be honest with you. I will say, though, what what is funny is that my family is is a bit into cars. Uh -huh. For instance, there was one point in my life when I was younger where I think almost all of us, myself, my cousins, uh, my uncle, like we all ended up with Fords at one point. And I'm mm -hmm. talking like I had an older Mustang. My sister had an older Mustang. My cousin had a Mustang. Like we just somehow, it was really funny. I remember years ago taking a picture. We were having a family barbecue or something. And I just happened to be in the front yard and I'm looking at all the cars on the street and it made me laugh. And <laughs> I don't think I have the picture anymore, but it was just all Fords. It was a couple Mustangs, a truck. Yeah. And so I don't know cars though. I've, I'm not well educated in cars. It's one of the things that um, being in the racing world is kind of funny because whenever something happens or technical things uh, are announced it's I'm the one that has to ask all the questions because I don't understand it so, but it's fun to learn but no I've, I've never been one of those big into cars I've always had practical cars and when I first started driving got the hand-me-downs you know I, I think my first car was my dad's old uh what was it I don't know what year it was but it was a Chevrolet Blazer, I believe. Okay. Yeah. The, one, old, the old SUVs. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I think that's what it was. So uh, I had a, like I said, my Mustang, it was older. So I, it was like a, I think it was a 2003 or maybe, a, maybe even a 99. So it was, you know, I thought it was cool because again, I'm a teenager driving, but it wasn't flashy or anything. Yeah. But no, I, I can't really say I have um, a special car or anything, but my, my family has certainly been into cars over the years. I've always said you don't have to know a lot about cars to love cars or enjoy cars. And well, listen, I appreciate a flashy car like anybody else, right? <laughs> so. <laughs> sure. Yeah. So if I uh, so if I offered you a Ferrari, you wouldn't hand, you wouldn't turn away. Right. Yeah. Right. If okay. you want to hand over the keys, I'm all for it. <laughs> okay. There you go. Awesome. I'm going to be your car psychologist today. Okay. So sit back and think about this. If you were manifest as a car, and this isn't what you want to be, this is your personality, the woman in the mirror, manifest as a vehicle, what would you be, but more importantly, why? Mm, I have been thinking about this question since I knew we were going to talk. <laughs> it, it's a unique one. <laughs> it is unique. I, I love it. I love it. Again, going back to what we were talking about a minute ago of unique questions and making people think. Mm -hmm. I love the question, but again, it makes me think because I'm not, again, I'm not well educated in cars. So what I came up with was a Ford GT. Oh, okay. Uh, because first off, I will admit, I think they look 
tremendous. It's just a good looking car. But as I've read up a little bit on it so that I can answer this question to, again, match it with my personality, it sounds like it's one of those things or it's one of those cars where in everyday life, it's calm, it's practical, it gets the job done, but it can be competitive and get the job done and it has some power behind it when it needs to. So if I am understanding the Ford GT right, I think that would match up with me. Again, get to A to B, don't over push it. It is what it is. But if you got to get competitive and you got to put the power down and you got to go for it and be hungry, that's me is you got to know what the occasion calls for. And again, it looks good. Not saying I look good. I want to look good. Um, (laughs) It's a good looking car. Um, You know, from what I understand, you can't really do much on the inside. So I don't know how that would match up with my personality. I don't want to go too deep here, Mark. Okay, that's um, for our next session. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) You got to take these slow at a time. No, you've answered the question really well. And I, I appreciate it because many times people on the show, though, co- I'll always go down towards what they want to be. And I always try to say, no, no, you've got to dig a little deeper into your psyche. But some people maybe don't want to go there. They don't want to open some of those doors. But you've you've done a nice job with that. Yeah, it's a vehicle that that does what it does well. And when it has to, it'll do it even better uh, if the requirements are there. So if I'm understanding what you're saying, right. So exactly. I think that's what it is. Like I said, I've been reading up on it and and that's exactly what it sounds like. So hopefully that's correct. Yeah. They're, uh, they're wonderful vehicles. And the first gen that came out versus the newer ones that are out, you've got Very different kinds of cars there as well, but I think they both relate back nicely to the original uh, Ford GT40, which is where that that, uh, heritage and that inspiration originally came from. The first one, of course, looks much more like it. The new one is like the modern version, but that's where they had to go, so... (laughs) <laughs> they're beautiful. They're beautiful cars. Fun. I've not driven the new one. I've driven the other one, uh, which it will bite you if you're not careful. No traction control in that thing. So you got to be very careful with all that power. See, I like that. I like that. It'll oh, bite you if you're not careful. Bite. Okay. Okay. There you go. There you go. Be careful around <laughs> Kelly. Don't mess with her. So how about great books? Great reading. Is there a book you'd like to share? Since you're a writer, I assume you're a reader. Well, I mean, I laughed when I thought about this question or (laughs) saw this question on your show sheet because I thought it was put in there specifically for me, Mark, because I love to read. Well, you're you're special, Kelly. I don't want to upset you Uh, (laughs) because I've heard you might bite. (laughs) (laughs) There you go. Look at that. Um, I love to read. Big reader. Um, That's another thing I've been doing since I was young and, and in school. Just I don't remember when it started, but I've always loved books. I was just having this conversation the other day, actually, with someone because they saw I had a stack of books with me, actually, during the Charlotte test over here in NASCAR. We had a test for next gen and I brought some books with me because we were sitting there from 9 a.m. to 8 p.m. on the one day. And I said, well, if I run out of things on my to do list and I'm all caught up with my content, I'll read a book. And so I was having this conversation the other day with someone I've read. 63 books already this year. I read 91 last year during the pandemic. So I love to read. Uh, I will read anything if it sounds interesting. So any genre. Um, I just finished up reading Bill Cowher's biography, Pittsburgh Steelers, former Pittsburgh Steelers coach. Uh, I'm a Steelers fan, so I had to read (laughs) that one. And I really enjoyed it, though. So getting back to your question is just the way he approached coaching, Mm -hmm. I you know, how you lead men into battle, but also how you want them to be good members of society. And the Pittsburgh Steelers are are an organization that wants to win football games, but the Rooney family, if anybody knows about the Rooney family, they care very much about giving back to the community. So it was very interesting to read Bill Cowher's book and get insight into that. I just finished, we'll keep it on the racing topic here. I just finished Al Antra Jr.'s biography, which was tremendous, but very, very heavy. Um, Is that the most... The most recent book that just came out um, about his... Yes. Okay. Yeah, I just had the yeah, author of so, that book, uh, Jade uh, Gers, was just on my show last week. I saw that. Jade's going to be on my podcast here soon, also talking about the book. Uh, Jade's wonderful. But yes, uh, Al Unter Jr.'s book, for any race fan, I think is a, a tremendous read. The honesty, and as you, well, you've talked to Jade, so as I'm sure you know, just the honesty in that book about not just his career, but the drug use and his personal life was tremendous. So yes, I'm a big reader. As I said, I'll read anything uh, from history and biographies to mysteries. I'm a big James Patterson fan. So his mystery novels that I love. But I, one of the things that I'll say one last one is Think Like a Monk by Jay Shetty. I read that during the pandemic uh, late last year. And I just loved it so much about just staying focused on the important things and just 
how to not necessarily train your brain, but again, just focus on important things in life, how to treat yourself, how to uh, remember that you're not your thoughts. You know, I know a lot of people, uh, if you deal with mental illness or whatever, just it, I really just connected to that book. I just felt like it's a book for everyone, whether you're dealing with something or you're not dealing with something, which again, everybody in life has something, right? So I just really, really loved the lessons in that book. So it was called Think Like a Monk. And uh, the title might throw people off. He's not trying to convert you to go be a monk and go off and, 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 and meditate for 24 hours a day. But he gives a lot of great tips again of just how to treat yourself well and, and focus on the important things in life. And, uh, just remember that, uh, your brain is basically, uh, running wild. And sometimes we don't have control over that. And he just kind of wants to teach you how to center yourself again. I like it. You might enjoy a, a book I read a long time ago by Robin Sharma, the monk who sold his Ferrari. Have you ever heard of that one? I haven't, but I'm very interested. I'm yeah. going to mark that down. Yeah, yeah. You're speaking of monks. Very nice. Uh, great books. Great that you're a reader like that. You sound like my wife. She devours books, and so does my son. <laughs> They're just, I, I envy them because I'm a slower reader, and it takes me a long time to get through a book sometimes. I think I need to think more like a monk so I can clear my mind while I'm reading because too much stuff comes in and infiltrates my head while I'm trying to read the There you go. Read That's the, the book for you. That's yeah. exactly what it is. Sometimes right. you just need to refresh and, and refocus. Yeah. I love it. I'm going to let you go on the ultimate drive today, which means I have a magic scepter, which allows you to pick any car, any person, living or deceased, which makes it very interesting. And you can be driving anywhere. What does the ultimate drive look like for you if money were no object? <laughs> this is another question that I really loved. And you might think that this is a cop out, but I've done this before and I want to do it again. Okay. And it's not a road car. It's not one, a sports car or anything. It's nothing flashy. I took a ride along with Joey Logano a few years ago in his Ford Mustang at Daytona International Speedway. And he drove, I was the passenger, and I just absolutely loved it. And I want to do more of that. I want to do that again. I, I love Daytona. Uh, the sun was setting. It was just my home away from home and just being inside a race car and getting to feel that and understand what the driver goes through to feel the G forces, the banking, the speed. So I am going to say if I could do that again, just getting back into a ride along passenger seat of a, of a race car with a driver and just getting to experience that and remember uh, why I like racing and how unique it is and how I guess you would say that cliche of ordinary men doing extraordinary things. Yeah. At least that's how I look at them. Uh -huh. So I would that would be that's what I would do is, is, is get me back inside a race car. There you go. Sounds like fun. Before I let you go today, would you share with us maybe uh, parting words of wisdom, some inspirational success quote, maybe of some kind? <laughs> You know, I think it goes back to a little bit of what we talked earlier, Mark, which again is just uh, experience, network, um, challenge yourself, be different when you can, but know your stuff, right? Um, do your homework, know what you're talking about, know the person you're talking about. Uh, and another thing too is be present, be present in whatever you're doing, whatever you're doing at that moment, focus on that. Um, you know, not necessarily when it comes to distractions, but for instance, you know, if I'm writing a story or, or if I'm at the racetrack, that is what I am doing. I, I'm not going to think about the meetings or, um, what I got going on during the week or somebody that has to talk to me, just be present in whatever you're doing and enjoy it and focus on it and do it a hundred percent. So, Again, know what you're talking about, be good at it, enjoy it, and uh, yeah, just, just be present in that moment. And if you're having trouble being present in that moment, you may want to read Jay Shetty's book, Think <laughs> Like a Monk. There you go. That might help you a little bit. Jay Shetty's getting a lot of advertising he on is. this podcast. Yeah, today. yeah. I'll look for a check in the mail from him. Probably won't see one. But at any rate, what's the best way for people? And you mentioned a podcast. So what's the best way for people to find your podcast and listen? 
Yeah, absolutely. The Racing Writers Podcast. It's available, well, a new episode is available every Monday morning. You can find that on any major podcast platform. So Apple Podcasts, Google, Spotify. I believe it's also on iHeartRadio, uh, CastBox. I mean, all kinds of platforms I've never even heard of. But all the major <laughs> yeah. ones, such as Apple, Google, and Spotify. Uh, the Racing Writers Podcast. So if you follow me on social media, you'll see it posted there all throughout the week. New episodes every Monday. And... Yeah, social media, Twitter is the best one, at Kelly Crandall, but you can also find my name on Instagram as well. I got lucky, as I tell people, that I was able to use my name and not have to come up with any kind of yeah. funky funky usernames on any of these social media platforms. So you can find me uh, on Twitter. I am verified. So that makes it easier as well. Look for the blue check mark. And there's a public Facebook page as well. There's Instagram, racer.com, the Racing Writers Podcast, uh, a little bit of everything. Going back to what we were talking about earlier, trying to be multifaceted. I know there's probably other platforms I should probably learn and, and get into, but those are the biggest ones for me. It's an ever changing platform for all of us, that's for sure. And uh, I just got through dealing with Six people I found using my picture being Mark Green on different social media sites, uh, <laughs> primarily Instagram. And people kept saying, do you know this so-and-so is trying to be you? It's like, oh, geez. Yeah. When you've got a kind of a plain Jane name like I do. Well, listeners, you can find everything Kelly has shared today on her car. She has shown us page. It's Kelly, K-E-L-L-Y Crandall, C-R-A-N-D. A L L. Check it out. Check out her podcast. Check her out on racer.com. She is everywhere. And I want to do a shout out. Thank you to uh, Melinda Russell for uh, introducing me to Kelly. She's been a guest on the show here. So thank you, Melinda, for bringing a, another great guest to the Cars Yeah podcast. Kelly, thanks for being so generous today with your time and your expertise and for sharing your experiences with the listeners. Until you and I talk again, I'll see you down the road. <laughs> Did you know that less than 3% of all automotive technicians in the United States are women? You may not be surprised, but you should be concerned because our country is facing a massive technician shortage right now. Skilled, qualified techs are in high demand, and we need young women and men to consider these careers as a viable path to a fulfilling life. I've interviewed hundreds of women in the automotive sector here on Cars Yeah, and I know that women make great Tax. That's why I support the nonprofit Tech Force Foundation and its Women Techs Rock initiative to ensure women see themselves in the profession, the industry, and the workforce. Learn more at techforce.org today. Thank you so much for joining us on today's ride here at Cars Yeah. Drive on over to CarsYeah.com to find show notes and inspiring automotive fun. Download your free copy of Filler Up, a fun book filled with gorgeous photographs of fuel filler fun, including quotes from more inspiring automotive enthusiasts. Download your copy today, and we'll see you next time on Cars Yeah!